So a few months ago, I decided that I wanted to learn to play the hurdy-gurdy and getting hold of a hurdy-gurdy is quite a difficult thing, especially here in the UK. If you look online, there are loads of Chinese instruments which I was warned off. I was told that they might look really nice, but they weren't. So I looked elsewhere and, you know, prices can go up to five, six thousand pounds. I wasn't up for spending that amount of money. And then I discovered Robert Mandel and he's made hurdy-gurdies for a very long time. And he makes all kinds. The one I bought is called the Symphonia, this one here, and it's kind of the, the budget, if you like, version. Having said that, it's still a, a lovely instrument and plays really well. I've owned it for a couple of days. When it arrived, it was very securely packed in a polystyrene case, like a fitted polystyrene case and uh, there wasn't a mark on it when it arrived. I think before I play it, I'm gonna show you around the instrument and then I'm going to try and make some sounds on it for you. This is the Robert Mandel Symphonia. It's a very nicely made three string hurdy-gurdy. The Symphonia is one of the earliest forms of the hurdy-gurdy and this dates back to the 13th century, although this was made in 2021 and I've received it in 2022. I've got the lid on at the moment, this thing here, but we'll open it up in a moment. Just outside here, you can see these keys, which you'll see better in a moment. At this end of the instrument, we have the peg box. Obviously, you can see the three huge pegs there. And then this is the key box. And then out of sight at the moment, I'll just slide this down a bit so you can see it. You can see the crank there. In the lid, we've got a set of four sound holes, very decoratively done. This just fits loosely on top, we'll lift it off, and here we are. By the way, there's a little piece of wood here that you can turn that stops the lid sliding off once it's on the top of the uh, key box. So we've got the crank, we've got the three places where the three strings are tied, we've got the end of the rod that connects to the bridge, and we've got a place to fix a guitar strap, and there's one at the other end as well. So that's the outside. Now the inside of the instrument, we have the strings coming through. This string here is the main drone string, the Petit Bourdon. It's not particularly low. It's actually set to C3, and this string here is the melody string, and that is tuned to G4. It's the highest pitched of the three strings. And this string here, hopefully you can see, is the trompet string, which is a drone string, which is tuned an octave higher than the other drone string. And it's also attached to this piece of black plastic, which is called the dog, that does the buzzing sound. And the amount of buzz is set with the tarant, this peg here, and there's a little kind of cord here, Why? I'm not quite sure what it is. I think it's a piece of... Um, plastic or something but it's tied to this string here and the more tension you put on it the more buzz you get. So this is the wheel. I think the wheel is made of a, a plastic, a very hard plastic and you'll see where the strings go over the wheel we have cotton and that's to stop the strings wearing out and also to improve the tone. The cotton is like the, the bow of a violin. The French name of this instrument is the Vie Roux, which is the, the wheel violin. And instead of a bow, uh, we use the wheel. But of course, uh, if we just use the wheel, the strings would uh, wear out very quickly, it wouldn't sound very good. So this cotton is like the hairs of violin bow. And we have to put rosin on the wheel in a special way, liquid rosin, and I've already done that. Sometimes we need to free up the wheel to put rosin on it or clean it. And we've got little parking spaces for the strings. The one for the drone string is here. Can you see that's going into that little groove there? The one for the melody string is on top here, like that. And the one for the trumpet string is here. It goes in there. And now the wheel will run freely. I can't turn the crank because it's on the table here, but the wheel would run freely now. Uh, you mustn't touch the wheel because if you do, you put grease on it and uh, it won't work properly so the wheel would run freely now uh, and that's very useful sometimes and it's good for practicing sometimes if you want to practice silently you can do that without making any sound and this thing does make a lot of sound let's put the strings back i don't like putting the tension on them like that
unlike a guitar, this uh, instrument has a separate bridge for each string. This one here for the Petit Bourdon or the, the drone. This one here for the Chanterelle or Chanter. On bagpipes you have a Chanter, don't you, that plays the tune. And this bridge here for the trompet string, which has this little piece of plastic, like I said, which is called the dog, which is set into this piece of wood, but is free so that it will vibrate against the soundboard here and create the buzz. And I'll show you that when I take this in the studio. So that's kind of this end of the instrument. Moving down, we have this amazing array of keys. And the ones you can see are actually the sharps and the flats, the ones on top. There's a lower row just out of shot here, but you'll see that better when I actually play the thing. If I pull a few of these out, these ones that I'm pulling out here, uh, those are the main notes. So this melody string is tuned to G4. So this is how it works. When you push the key in, it's attached to this piece of wood, all part of the same assembly. And on the end of the piece of wood, we have this, I think it's plastic. I could be wrong, it might be wood. Anyway, this black thing here you can see is called the tangent. And you can see there's a screw on it and there's a reason for that. The tangent is tapered, so when it strikes the string, it's only a tiny part of the tangent hits the string. And obviously down here we've got all the lower notes and then as we go up, we have the higher notes and notice how the tangents get closer together up here. So low pitch to high pitched and obviously up here the string is at its shortest vibrating length. I mean if you play the, the very top note, this one here, the operating length or the vibrating length is from the tangent to the bridge there. So that's probably about three or four inches. But down here of course much much further. Let's get a ruler and measure that shall we? The lowest note, the vibrating length of the string is about one foot and one and three quarter inches or about 34 and a half centimetres. And the highest pitch note, you're looking at about three and a half inches or nine centimetres. So it's, uh, you know, it's a fairly basic idea, but it's not basic to build. It's a complicated thing to build. And like I say, this thing is built absolutely beautifully. Okay, and obviously the two drone strings the trumpet and probably can't see this but the main drone string they disappear into the peg box through these holes here and here up to the pegs but the melody string goes over this nut here and up to the peg i'm going to turn the thing around so you can see a few different angles now so let's just turn it up on its side so all the tangents will drop back so we're on our side now and these are the keys i was talking about and obviously like I say, there are no springs with this. You simply push the string, and imagine this was up the other way, and the, the keys just drop back by gravity. You can see these lovely sound holes in groups of four. So you get some sound coming out of the thing. And uh, so that's that side of it. Let's tip it up the other way. Actually, I won't lay it down. I don't want to lay it down on its keys, but you can see it's sealed that side. Let's show you this end with the three pegs poking through. You can see we've got a strap button there as well. So we'll just pop the lid back on. The thing weighs about eight and a half pounds. So it's not really heavy, but it's a little bit awkward to hold. I found moving around the house here, got to be a bit careful. It's something that you could drop. I don't intend on dropping it, but you could drop it. So you have to be very careful when you're lifting it around. Obviously don't lift it up by the pegs, lift it underneath. Make sure you cradle the thing so that it's safe. If you're someone that likes dimensions, the length of the instrument is two foot one inches, including the peg box and the crank, or 63 centimeters. So this way it's 63 centimeters. It's eight inches wide, or 20 centimeters, including the keys, which there, of course. It's seven inches high. So from this tabletop up to the top of the lid, it's seven inches high or 18 centimeters. And like I say, it weighs eight and a half pounds or about 3.9 kilograms. It actually feels to me a bit heavier than that, but it's probably because it's a little bit of a, an awkward lift. Once you've got it on, I mean, I sit and play it and I've got a guitar strap around my back and I'll show you that in a moment. You know, it doesn't feel any weight at all. So that's all the facts and figures. 
uh, let's take it in the studio now and make some sound with it. Okay, so that was our trip around the instrument. Now let's try and make some music with it. The first thing I'm going to need is a guitar strap, which I put around my back like this, and then I'm going to fit it to the strap buttons that I showed you either end of the instrument. It wants to be on your back, not sort of lower than that, because otherwise it won't support the instrument. And once you start cranking, of course, there's going to be some movement, so you want some support. You want to feel the strap at the base of your back, you want to feel the weight of the instrument pulling on it, um, because that's what you're going to need when you start playing. Now notice that it's angled down. It's not straight up like that, because if it is, it won't work, because these keys won't fall back. See how if I play, push the keys in, they fall back by gravity. Now I've got my boss tuner here, my boss guitar tuner. I'm going to use this just to check the tuning. Uh, I might need to turn the record level down when I start playing. The drone string, the string I'm going to tune first, the Petit Bourdon, that's this one here. Hopefully I've got that name right. There's a, a Grand Bourdon, which is a, a lower pitch one you get on some other instruments. I'm going to tune that string to C3. Put my tuner on. Uh, it's going to detach the other strings for a moment. So I'm just disengaging the melody string and the trumpet strings. That's showing a little bit flat at the moment. It's a bit sharp as you can hear. So it's It's a little bit hard with these friction tunes to get it spot on. That's pretty close. Let's uh, engage the melody string. Let's jump sharp. Some... It's best to go below and up. Not bad. I'll put the trumpet in. That's a bit flat. That's not bad. Right, okay. So we are in tune, just about. Not perfect. I've got a lot to learn about tuning and rosining and cottoning. So, pistol, third and fourth fingers underneath the crank handle, and then uh, two fingers round and thumb on top. And square onto it, not arm sticking out. I'll get all three strings rolling and then I'll start playing this little tune I wrote called The Medieval Christmas. I'm going to only play a bit of it. And notice I was getting a, a bark from the dog there uh, in, in position one, I think, which is where you go down and you accelerate the wheel. I've got a lot to learn, obviously on all of it, but particularly on the cooping, as that's called. So, sorry, that was probably pretty painful if you're an experienced hurdy-gurdyist, hurdy-gurdy player, uh, but it's kind of day one for me so I'm quite happy I've got something like a tune out of it. I probably need to re-cotton and re-rosin uh, fairly soon. It's getting a bit squeaky as you can hear. But uh, you know I'll take that for day one. I'm really enjoying learning this. There are hurdy-gurdies in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Robert Mandel makes uh, two or three models. This is kind of the base model but like I say this is based on a 13th century design. So it's a, it's tried and tested, I think you can safely say. Some hurdy-gurdies have a, a loot shape to the body. There's all kinds of things out there to explore. There's tons of stuff that you can find on the internet. A guy that's really helped me on the internet is Sergio Gonzalez, 
who is uh, a Spanish hurdy-gurdy player and teacher, a real character. He's got loads of great videos out there. Check him out. And I've been watching him avidly over the last few weeks while I've been waiting for my hurdy-gurdy to arrive. If you're not a fan of the hurdy-gurdy, uh, maybe I've changed your mind or persuaded you that it is a really great instrument. It's great fun to play. Obviously, you have to pick your moments to play it, uh, not when the dog's fast asleep. My dog goes a bit crazy when I start playing. Uh, it is pretty loud, I should warn you, although not, not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But this would be great if you were out in the streets busking, because you'd definitely be heard. The key to it, if you pardon the pun, is tuning. You've got to get the thing in tune. If it's not banging in tune, it's going to sound horrendous. I had a few problems with it yesterday. Uh, it was getting a bit scratchy, so I cleaned the wheel and I re-rosined, and uh, that solved the problem. I probably need to re-cotton uh, the strings. There's a lot to learn. But, um, like I say, early days. Thank you for watching, and you'll see me in my next video.